Hi. My name is Lise Stanfley Torme, and I'm a creative director of Green Dog Campaigns. And I have many, many years of experience working in politics. I came out of uh, gray advertising working on big Fortune 500 accounts. And then I did design work for a big branding company. And then I was hired for my first freelance project to work with uh, Landor, or, uh, excuse me, Clinton Riley campaigns. And we did the very first Dianne Feinstein campaign where she had to run a recall campaign after the Moscone milk murders. So I've been in politics for, since that time off and on. It's not all I do, but it's a passion of mine. And hello, everybody. I'm Steve Berto. I am the political director at Kathleen Russell Consulting, and uh, I also have uh, over a decade's worth of experience in running uh, and managing political campaigns, everything from sanitary districts to U.S. Congress, U.S. Senate. I ran the field campaign for the Carry for America campaign in 2004 in Ohio. Um, and elected Chris Murphy. I was his field director uh, in his campaign in the Connecticut 5th Congressional District to unseat No Child Left Behind architect Nancy Johnson. Um, since then, uh, I, I was doing that work with the Working Families Party and, and ACORN, and I was uh, ACORN's deputy national political director and the executive director of Connecticut ACORN. Um, upon moving to California, I started working with Kathleen Russell Consulting, where over the last four years, we've done uh, nine campaigns in Marin and are 9-0 and in Marin. We are undefeated in Marin, and we are 10 or 9-1 and overall uh, since I took over the political division over there. So um, we have a broad range of experience, anything from materials and strategy. We really specialize in field and organizing your volunteers and putting together a tight campaign so that you, you win on election day. Okay, where are we first? Here, what are we covering? You're doing the kitchen cabinet. Uh, kitchen cabinet, a very favorite topic of mine because I've both been a member of kitchen cabinets, I've been a founder of kitchen cabinets, I've been a participator in kitchen cabinets, and I've also been a victim of kitchen cabinets. <laughs> So I'd like to tell you about what works best about them and what does not. Uh, in 1988, I uh, worked with the city of Oakland. I founded an environmental organization for open space and created a $65 million general obligation bond and then ran the campaign to pass that bond on a volunteer basis with only volunteer involvement, no professional involvement at all, though I was a professional. I wasn't paid for that service, but it was highly gratifying. It was gratifying and it was successful because my kitchen cabinet was awesome. I chose the best, I got the best. I had a woman who was on the Republican National Steering Committee and I had her equivalent in the Democratic Party. Fantastic people. I had a man who was the uh, president of the NAACP. I had a former mayor of Oakland. I had two parks people who were elected to office. So choose people who have something to give. And all these people were seniors and I was a puppy. I was in my mid-30s and I, they called me the kid but I was the fearless leader. Together these people got us through the election. And believe me, it really was as if I was running myself for office because we were pitching our project in each CD district of uh, the city of Oakland to the city council, to the city manager, to the city attorney, to the Rotary Clubs, the Sunrise Clubs, and the Chamber of Commerce. We had the only organized opposition we had against us at the end of the campaign was the Chamber of Commerce. And we beat them with the best advice coming from my kitchen cabinet, writing op-eds, putting out very tight materials that talked to the issues. The messaging was very clear. The graphics and the branding were all consistent, and the cabinet supported me in all that work. So when you choose your kitchen cabinet, choose experience, and use the experience what, in what they are best at. If you've got a great proofreader on the board, I had the editor from UC Press on my kitchen cabinet. So there was nothing that got published without Harlan looking at it. But he had also been someone elected to office. So it worked real well. 
Choose your treasure carefully. There are lots of rules, pitfalls that you can fall through if you don't report on a timely basis and report everything you need to and gather all the little crumbs of uh, facts that you have to. People's occupations, people's telephone numbers, people's employers, what they do, how much they gave. You've got to keep really tight records on all that. So experience matters on your kitchen cabinet. So I think I'm going to turn this over to Steve because I'm about at my elevator speech length. As, as a teacher, I like to uh, engage in very short sound bites and then uh, question the students or, and ask for feedback or pass it over to my peers. Thanks, Lise. And I think everything Lise just said about kitchen cabinets is spot on. You definitely want experience. This is the group that's going to be your core group advisors as the campaign goes on, so you definitely want them to be people that are knowledgeable about the community about the community and bring something to the table for your campaign. Um, you know, it, when this this whole panel is about laying the groundwork and you know, selecting your kitchen cabinet is one of the first things you need to do. The other thing you need to do, and, and you guys are gonna hate me for this, is fundraise. No candidate likes it, every candidate needs to do it. Um, and you know, it, it comes in a number of different colors. One of them is you first need to assess your field of candidates. And you need to see, all right, is this going to be a major race? If you're running for, you know, Novato Sanitary District, I mean, there's not going to be a lot of people that are really jazzed up about giving money to a sanitary district candidate. Not true. You never it, know. You never know. I, I've only done the last six sanitary district elections of Marin, but. I mean, people don't get jazzed up about that. It's a fact of life. So what you have to do is you're not going to get more outside support. You have to go more to your base of support, your family, your friends, the people that no matter what are going to give you money. Because the way you attract more money is by le leveraging early money. Um, does anybody, has anybody heard of the group Emily's List? No. Does anybody know what it stands for? Early money is like yeast, it grows. And that's no different than you know anything else. If you're if you're running to do something, if you're gonna put your best into it, you need to I, I, I am constantly astounded by the number of candidates who say, I'm gonna run, but I wanna do as little as possible to run to, to do it. And that that's just not gonna cut it. I mean you need to I make sure all of my candidates spend at least three hours a week on the phone with donors, whether it's a sanitary district race or a congressional district race. I'm sure you've all heard the stories about Senator Boxer. She has staff that makes her sit in a room and do nothing but make fundraising calls, and they sit in there with her while she does it to make sure that she does it because you need to fundraise. Money wins in politics, and, and again, you know, I'll, I'll say this to say, one of the biggest things you could really fundraise for, especially if you're a new candidate, is if you don't know what you're doing, hire a consultant. We're gonna, we're gonna make the most out of your two most limited resources, which are your volunteers and your money. We're gonna show you how to best spend your money. We're gonna show you how to best deploy and most strategically deploy your volunteers very very important that you do fundraising and you know nobody's going to be happy about it because like i said nobody likes doing it asking for money is a tough thing but it is a it is a necessity in running political campaigns if you want to run to win you need to run you need to raise funds um if if you know for example we have campaigns coming up right now we've printed off our walk pieces for one of them so we got to give six hundred dollars to the printer tomorrow to pick up those walk pieces we have yard signs that we have to put out another twelve hundred dollars next next week to pick up those yard signs and then when it comes to mailers printing a mailer isn't that expensive mailing postage. it postage kills you you're talking depending on the size of the mailer 21 cents 25 cents a mailer and if you you know Chris, you're running in Fairfax. There's 5,000. There's 5,025 registered voters in Fairfax. If you were gonna, um, if you were gonna send a mailer to every registered voter in Fairfax, you're looking at basically, you know, $1,600 just in postage. So raising money is so important because there's everybody. And, and keep in mind, we're a firm that specializes in field operations, going door to door, talking to people about the campaign, training your volunteers to do that. 
but you cannot. You can't, unless you have the campaign strength of the Obama campaign with hundreds of thousands of volunteers, you're not gonna hit every door. So you need to be able to touch those people in some other way. Mail is a great way to do it. You can't send mail if you can't fundraise. We like to say Marin is a mail campaign county. There's not one winning campaign that doesn't send a mailer. It's the way to touch everybody in Marin. To do that, you need to raise funds. And to be able to save money, and this is my pitch, to be able to save money on your mailers, you need to have a consultant or somebody that knows how to strategically target it so you're not sending to somebody who doesn't vote in your election. So, you know, that I'll leave that at the fundraising thing, but just know steering committee is your number one priority because you need to have support to run. Fundraising is your second priority. Yeah, I just want to bounce off the fundraising thing too because I've run campaigns on very limited amounts of money and then I've run successful campaigns where more was spent. Um, your fundraising is the most important thing you can do, but get, give yourself a chance to get into it slowly. It's hard work. It's emotionally hard work. Asking for things for yourself. It's, and I work with a lot of women candidates, and we have a very, very high rate of success with our women candidates. But one of the hardest things for women is asking for something for themselves. How many of you have ever had that problem? There are a lot of women here today, and I'm really encouraged that you're here. But how many of you have a hard time asking for something just for yourself? Ah, such honesty. It's refreshing. Um, that's good in politics. We like it. It's very good. Well, I do too, and I know how hard it is. But you're going to ask from friends and family first. Then you're going to open it up to circle of friends, circle of colleagues, those people you touch in day-to-day -day life. Ask your accountant. Ask your doctor. Ask your doctor to believe in you. You believed in your doctor. Don't you think your doctor should believe in you? I think so. I mean, my doctor would be, I would ask my vet, you know, my horseshoer, you know, all of them. Um, ask those people whose lives you touch. You know, I would probably, I teach at Dominican, I teach layout and graphic design and journalism at Dominican, and I would ask my colleagues if I was going to run for something. I ran a successful flood election, um, flood drainage fee election with Hal Brown and uh, then had suffered through all the appeals all the way up to the Supreme Court when we won. And uh, I asked for a lot of money for that. It was easier for me to ask for the money for the flood fee than it was to ask for myself. So play a little mind game, why don't you? Just take your brain and say, it's for the campaign. I'm asking for this for my campaign. You can kind of soften the my if you want, if it makes it emotionally easier for you to ask for the money. But ask for the money. It's absolutely essential. It's the life's blood of a, a political campaign. And I agree with everything he said about mail because that's our experience too. Our successes in Marin have happened because we've had good mail. It's had a mail that had message right on, and we'll get into this later, but it had branding right on. The photos were good, the art direction was consistent, and the message did not talk down or talk up to the audience. It just hit the points it needed to hit, and it was strategic. Okay, where are we now? Messaging. Ah, so messaging. I love messaging because I'm a visual person, I'm a visual communicator, that's how I've been trained, but I've also been trained as a word communicator. and. It's so much fun in a political campaign because you get to do both. You get to be visual and you get to be textual. And you get to be web and you get to be active. And if there's enough money left over, sometimes you get to be audio in terms of robocalls or radio ads or broadcast in terms of video or streaming video on a website. Those are all things that you can consider for your campaign but you get to do both. Your message should be heartfelt. It should generate from your core philosophies, whatever they are, whatever you got, whatever put you into this race, your message should generate from your core philosophies and your core experiences. And you, first of all, 
in your important walk pieces, in your elevator speeches, which you give to groups, um, which you, which you uh, craft in your debates, they all need to relate to your core experiences. What rings your bell? Why are you in this race? You know, with Diane Feinstein, when, when she was running for the first time, we had to uh, brand her. And she didn't belong in a red, white, and blue experience in San Francisco. <laughs> it just, it wasn't done. But all political campaigns up to that point were really red, white, and blue. And a bunch of us went to Clinton and Riley and we said, we don't think she should be red, white, and blue. Well, what color do you think she should be, Lisa? And I said, I don't know, purple, gold? Those are the Pope's colors. Let's make her different. You know, and she used purple and gold for the longest time. Boxer broke the mold by coming out with yellow and the strong black graphic box. You know, her name is Boxer. She used a visual device, an icon for a box, so that people can readily remember her name. For Senator Marks, I did three campaigns for him, election after election after election. The first one was hard to arrive at the graphics and the feeling and the messaging for him. The other two were a breeze because all we did was repeat on the success we had before. The headline was, Good Work, Senator Marks. He did his job in office. Good work, Senator Marks. Very strong explanation point. Everything was black and white. There was no color in the piece at all. It was all black and white, like a newspaper. And that was just a long, long list of accomplishments. No other copy. Headline at the bottom of the page, good work, Senator Marks. It was a message that worked for that campaign. And I didn't have to do too much after that. So you, so you want to be particularly strategic, but you want to be authentic and start from your base and start from your passion. Are you running against something? That's not enough. You have to run for something. So you have to have a vision. You have to have, feel a vision inside of yourself or how you're going to make a more positive contribution. You're going to make this a better, a stronger community. And, and you have to have such compelling language around it that you hook people into that. And don't forget the tone. The tone of the messaging has to be very much inclusive of the reader. You want to touch that reader. You don't want to just preach to the reader. You want to touch them. You want to engage them in the dialogue with you. Can't we build a better community together? You bet. Help me continue my good work, Senator Marks. Okay, I'm going to turn, turn it over to Steve. Yeah, the, the next thing we'll be talking about, and I think it's the perfect segue, is preparing for debates, forums, and TV, and I'll talk to a, to a limited extent, uh, because I know there's a panel about it later, but about uh, PAC and, and uh, newspaper interviews as well. Um, you know, it's what Lee's just said. You know, you, you develop your messaging. You have your core messaging, and then within that, you need to have underlying messages that talk to different audiences. That's the first real thing you know, important thing you need to remember when going to these different forums and events and interviews is you need to know your audience. It's no different than if you're doing a house party than if you're doing the Marin Women's Political Action Committee endorsement night because you're gonna, you need to see who's in the room and what speaks to them. You're not gonna talk to 65 and 70 year olds about social, social security the same way you're gonna talk to 30 year olds about social security. The messages, the overall messages may be the same but there are underlined messages that will resonate with each of those different groups, and that's something that's very important to remember. Um, so when you're preparing for candidate debates, forums, that kind of stuff, you know, a lot of the stuff that Jonathan was saying earlier really holds true here. You know, you want to dress nice. You don't want to be the guy showing up in the shorts and the uh, the polo shirt. You know, when all when everybody else on the panel is going to be in a suit and tie, you need to look the part. Um, and the other thing is being able to have your, working from your messaging, having your elevator speeches down. You, you shouldn't be fumbling through an introduction when you know every single one of these events you go to, you're going to be asked to do an introduction. You have to have that down. You have to make sure it's less than two minutes, and you have to make sure all your core messaging gets across in that two minutes. 
Um, from there, you need to prepare for the questions that you're likely going to be asked. Um, Gary, you're running in San Rafael. Um, number of big issues right now, pension reform, the target, the budget in general. Baseball. I mean, yeah, there, baseball. There is just no shortage of issues. And I'm sure you're spending your evenings writing down responses, talking to people about the issues, and really boning up on, on what your responses are going to be when you get there and are debating about this. Because that's going to be really important. And, and again, whether you're running for mayor of San Rafael, for town council in San Anselmo, or for Novato Sanitary District, these are things you have to have in your pocket. You can't go there, show up, and, and seem like you don't know what you're talking about because the voters that are in that room, there may only be 30 voters in that room, but those 30 voters are going to go and tell their friends, their family. They're going to send it out on email. So everywhere you go, just like Jonathan said, you need to show up and you need to be look the part. Um, that's something that's really important. And then again, like Lee said, you have your messaging, and it's all about branding your messages. So you want to keep repeating it. it, it I know sometimes, you know, as a as a PR consultant, you know, we don't want to be too repetitive because that's that's basically a form of bad grammar. Um, but in the in the sense of running your campaign, if you have a core message like keeping San Rafael working or something like that, you want to keep whittling that in. You want people to associate you with that message. Um, that's going to pay dividends come election day. So. You know, in terms of, you know, talking about forums to debates that are on TV, you know, I, I personally just love going to candidate forums to, even when I don't have a dog in the race, just to watch and see how people are preparing, how they're coming to the, to the forum, how they're answering the tough questions, because that tells you a lot about who they are. Um, and it tells you about a lot about what kind of a campaign they're running as well. Um, so very, very important. And, and of course, you know, the other stuff, eye contact all the time. You don't want to be the person that's looking down at your talking points. You need to have those talking points memorized. Um, and a big part of that is putting the time in to prepare. I mean, there's no better uh, preparation you could do for a candidate's forum or debate than actually prepare. Um, that's really, uh, it's like they say, you know, knowing is half the battle, preparing is half the battle for any debate because anything you're going to be asked, if you're prepared, you'll be able to answer in one way or another. And the last thing I'll say about that, is, and this is some advice that I give to all my candidates and, and I'll pass this on to you for free, um, which is that at, you see it all the time in debates, whether it's, you know, Boxer debating Fiorina or Brockbank debating Phillips, there will be a question and somebody will continue to answer the question after their time's up and you know that they fully haven't really gotten out what they wanted to say at that point. This is what I call the throwaway question. If you're in that situation and you feel that you, you have a lot more to say on one particular issue, um, wait till you get that question that is an easy up or down answer. Do you support Target, yes or no? No, absolutely not. I'd like to use the remainder of my time to address that question about so-and-so that you want to, you know, if you could answer a question quickly and then get back to a bigger issue that's more paramount to your campaign, that's a really key thing. And it shows that you haven't forgot the issue and you're on top of this and you're going to do everything you can to get your message out there. That's great. You keep referring to these events as debates. The ones that I go to seem more like just forums. It doesn't seem like there's any real debating going on. I wish they were debates. Uh, I take on that. Well, I think, you know, in, in terms of the last time you ran, Chris, in 2009, I, I was at every single one of those debates, and, and they, were, they were debates. You guys were all asked the same question, whether you're debating back and forth with each other or just answering the question differently. I, I would consider that a debate. You're, you're technically right. It is a forum, but it, it's a form of debate. Thank you. I, I've been at, been at both, where they're contentious. That's the way you want to do your debate. You never rise to take the bait of the baiting person who's coming from a position that's defensive but expresses itself as aggression. You never want to take that. And your best antidote for any of this is preparation, just like Steve says. You know, and if you don't have a position on something, for heaven's sake, say, you know what? I don't know enough about this situation yet. I just don't know enough. I don't have to prove I'm the good little girl and I know everything in the room and I have the answer to all the questions. I don't have to do that. 
I just have to say, you know what I'd do to that question? I'd pull a panel together of people who know. I'd, I'd compose that panel with some experts. I'd compose that panel with some citizens who are most deeply affected, the stakeholders in the situation. And maybe you want to suggest a facilitated meeting. A lot of people don't like those, they're afraid of them. But they're actually a, a good process. And they don't have to be cathartic in a bad sense. They can be what comes out of a facilitated meeting if a candidate puts it together, if a, uh, a, a city or a county or a state staff person or assembly person puts it together. What can come out of that is steps. Steps in the forms of contact, steps in the form of, of actions that can take place that exist in uh, current policy guidelines. And you can work away on an issue until you have agreement, until you can find common ground. Because really, that's what you're in the debate for. You're not in the debate to win over someone else. You're in the debate to convince the audience. You're in the debate to prove that you have more common ground with the voters than so-and-so does. Okay? And the best way you can do that is to speak your truth but speak it through an informed position. Okay? Where are we now? Hi. Yeah, hi. I would never recommend that a candidate uh, tell an untruth about their position. An omission? If you don't have a position, your position is that you don't have a position. You don't know enough yet. You don't have all the facts. But if you, if you do have a personal bias, but you might be willing to put your personal bias aside because you had compelling information coming from your constituency, that's another thing. But the, you don't want to say that necessarily. What you want to say is, I need to know more. Let's get people in a room and learn more. What, what I would say to that is essentially is somewhat the same in, in that, you know, if you actually have a position on it and you're asked your position and you think that um, not answering the question as directly as possible will get you some votes, that's a bad path to walk down. You know, you want to be with, you know, as a candidate, you need to have values. And if you're willing to sacrifice those values for votes, what type of a candidate are you? Well, I guess my, my question really is, you just don't want to get a debate on top of the debate, you know. Um, and it's just easier maybe just to, I don't know, just, I just, I'm thinking that it, like I had a campaign kickoff on Wednesday and I know I had people in the audience that were really against the Niven property or other issue. And I just wanted to keep it, you know, calm and area. But I just debate you don't have to do that, do you? Well, whether a, a debate or a house party, I mean, you need to be prepared for issues that are gonna come up that you may not want to talk about. And that's a big one for that, that area. That is really that's a, huge a big one. thing. I mean, that's why when I say, when I talk about preparation, it's really a big part of preparation is figuring out how you're gonna deal with the issues that you know you're gonna be asked that your positions may not be, you know, as favorable with the community you're gonna be talking to. Because, I mean, it happens to Obama all the time. You know, he's in these rooms where he's asked these tough, tough questions, and he answers them truthfully. And, and I think there's a way, and I really like how he does it, because he, he kind of, you know, acts as he's playing the middle ground there, but he's really, he's not changing his messaging one bit. He's changing his tone, he's changing his inflection, he's changing the way he talks about it, but his message is essentially the same. And, and you know, it, it, it's definitely one of those things. You're gonna be in rooms where people wanna ask you things that you probably don't wanna be asked you know, but a as a candidate, that's one of, that's, you know, when they ask you to, when you decide to put your name on that ballot and step out there and be a candidate, you're saying you're up for that task to go into those rooms and talk about those issues. And, and yeah, it's, I, I would be lying to every one of you if I said every campaign outing or house party or event you went to is going to be peaches and cream. I mean, you're, you're going to have bumps in the road. You know, as long as you do a good job of managing yourself as the candidate and stay true to yourself, 
there's really no way you could go wrong. Yeah. That was great. There, this is an interesting topic. Is there anyone else who has a question on debates and debate preparation? Okay. So we can go on to the next one? Yeah, literatures and mailers. Okay, literatures and mailers, timing, strategy. A couple things to think about. Um, if you can, um, the, our winning formula for Marin County tends to be mail at least twice. If it's a, a campaign that doesn't have a lot of assets to it, mail twice. Why do I say twice? Because most people are voting absentee now, okay? And you've got to get to those early absentees. But many people don't vote until the last day. And you've got to get them too. And if, if you've blown your wad on your absentees and a hit piece comes out on you close to the end, you have to be able to counter that. You have to be able to get your truth in front of the voters so they can make the best decision for them. And they want to make the best decision for them. Okay? We know that the people who vote in Marin tend to vote over and over again. And they, they vote, um, it, it's a smaller uh, down ticket in, in off presidential and governor races. It's a smaller population. But in Marin, it, its ratios are higher than it is in other places. We have, a more, we have a very educated populace. We have an older uh, population base. Uh, we have a lot of voters. Uh, your seniors are big voters, and they vote absentee. Okay. So on your mail, it should carry the branding that you've initiated at the beginning of your campaign, the same branding that you've poured into your website work. You don't need a lot of bells and whistles on your website. Does anyone know what the website is mostly used for in campaigns? What, what good do they think could come from a website? Yeah. Well, from my perspective, the website means that people who uh, electronically, that's their main way they communicate, can go to it and look at qualifications and positions and stuff like that, so it informs the electorate. Uh, precisely, and as, as someone in the press and who works on PR on a regular basis, I would say that it's most useful as a press point. And for people who are really savvy voters or savvy organizers around voting activities or voter information, okay, that's, that's it. But that said, we've been doing some very interesting campaigns lately where we have web banner ads that have a click-through link to campaign websites, and the campaign websites are being visited more, and even on election day, and we actually think it might have won a race. I, I would like to see the metrics on it. We haven't cooked the books on it yet, but I'd like to see it. Yes? What is a web banner? Uh, a web banner might be a Pacific Sun placed ad, long, horizontal, or vertical right column, good readership. It'll have an active link on it that will go to the campaign's website. On that website, if you have the budget, there might be a podcast from you. There might be a video that we've created, a commercial that, that can be aired. But all your biographical information will be there. Your positions on the issues will be there. Your qualifications will be there. And your endorsement list will be there. At a minimum, that's what I think a good HTML-based website should be. Do you need blogs? Do you need a content management system? No, no, no. You need just a very clean HTML website with great photography. Okay, Photography. I want to talk about photography. Because too many people don't think about photography. And as an art director, I go absolutely mad. <laughs> It'll get down to the last minute, and somebody will insist that I use a photo of, of them with Aunt Mabel, and it, it just doesn't work. So we, when we start early with campaigns, we budget photography into it. And I have a fabulous photographer I've shot with on commercial shoots and political shoots. Uh, year after year after year. He works for me at half rate for my political clients. He's a shooter who's, who's had his work in National Geographic and has had a show in the Met. I mean, he's great. He's awesome. And he works it. Now, when you take those photographs, if you do a professional photo shoot, book 
a lot of activities into your day that show you doing different things. Do you have to change your clothes? You bet. And, and contrary to what our friend said over here, Jonathan, don't wear a white shirt in a photo shoot. Absolutely not. And don't wear a busy pattern shirt. And ladies don't wear too many colors. I like what Eva wore today. Eva looks great. She's got a heavy neutral jacket on and she's got a bright red blouse and she's got a little pointy detail with the, um, with the button and she's got big jewelry. Big jewelry on ladies is great. My gold standard for a woman's appearance in a campaign, Jackie Spear. How many of you have ever seen Jackie Spear? I mean, she, does she look good? Does she look awesome? I mean, she, she rocks. I mean, she's, she's so beautiful. Uh, but she's got the hair. She's got the, the big jewelry. But then she's got the understated neutrals. So photography. Don't cheat yourself. If you have time coming into your campaign, sometimes you don't have time, and we have to use what you got. But if you have time, do a really good shoot. Okay? And then we can design mail around image and around message. And sometimes that message visually doesn't have anything to do with the text. Uh, the, the last mailer we did for Richard Benson, I just want to tell this story really quickly and then I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Um, the last piece we did was a knockoff. It was a knockoff of a Harry Potter book cover. You guys know who Harry Potter is. Did any of you see this piece? It had a Benson for Assessor magic wand pencil shooting out sparks with Harry Potter typeface saying, don't be fooled. The opposition was telling a lot of untruths about our client. And uh, we wanted to set the record straight. So the inside of the brochure went to all these mythological creatures, and each one related to a myth that was put out about our candidate. And, and you know, it, it was a funny piece, and it arrived on doorsteps right around Halloween time. And so we liked to think that the little kids would pick it up going, oh, what's this, Harry Potter, um, Benson for Assessor. And, you know, it, it was really sweet. But um, uh, Dick Spotswood said that we ran a classy campaign. And um, I think that's, that's the way I like to be thought of, is running a classy campaign. Thank you. And, you know, I would just add to that by saying, you know, in terms of your you know, bare essentials um, in terms of literature and mailers. Um, you know, literature, you definitely want to walk piece. Whether you're gonna walk doors or not, I, I strongly suggest walking door to door, and I'll be on a panel later talking about that. But, um, you know, you want something to have at the endorsement meetings, at the IJ interviews. You know, and, and I don't know if Dick or Doug was gonna talk about this when they were up here, but one of the things we always make sure our candidates have before they go into the uh, IJ or the Pac Sun is their literature. That's part of our timeline for developing literature, is making sure that they have it for the IJ because they want to see that. You know, it, it all goes again to looking the part. If you come to somebody's door, you go to the IJ with a with a piece of loose leaf, you know, this is my campaign, and somebody comes with their 60 pound, 80 pound card stock on gloss matte, and they're looking real legit. I mean, how does that make you look as the candidate? I mean, a lot of people like to talk about going grassroots, and we're all for that. I mean, we are a grassroots firm, but you gotta, I mean, again, if you wanna run a campaign, you should run something that looks like a campaign. Um, the other thing is that, you know, I, I generally say, my, my Marin rule is you only need, is you need to mail once without a doubt. You, you should at least send one mailer, and you could break those up in one, one of the same mailer to PAB voters, permanent absentee voters, and poll voters. But you know, if you are one of these campaigns with a limited budget, one of the best ways you could save on that second mailer is getting your volunteers and getting that walk piece out yep. to the doors. The other thing you could do is, again, have a consultant and purchase a list that allows you to target le legitimately target and strategically target to get it down. There are, you know, again, I'll use Fairfax as an example. There's 5,025 registered voters in Fairfax. However, if you run a report on how many of those voters voted in three of the last three elections, you're, you're working with a group of about 200 and uh, 2,600 voters. 
So what, you know, rather than spending all that money that we discussed earlier on postage, you know, we'll walk those other doors. You know, we're gonna mail to those hot doors, the people that are voting three out of the last three elections. So you can always be a little more strategic in how you target and deploy your mail, because again, it's gonna be one of the most, you know, one of the biggest expenses your campaign will incur. And, and I'll be talking a little more, bit more about field later, so I'll just kinda leave it at that. Yeah, I just wanted to say about walking. I'm, I live in San Anselmo, and so I'm very close to the neighborhoods. And I've walked, I think, every precinct in San Anselmo and talked to so many people. But I learned how to walk from the master, Paul Chignell. <laughs> I mean, if a baby was born in San Anselmo, you would get a card, a postcard from him, saying congratulations on your new baby. And he would frequently walk. He walked in every single election. I second that. We worked with uh, Paul on Fort Greene's last election. We'll be working with Ford again this November. Um, Paul is a great guy. He is one of those guys that demands. And this is where him and I just totally see eye to eye. He demands you get to every door. And yes. San Anselmo, yes. Fairfax, those are actually places where it's you doable. can get to. It's it doable. is doable. You can get to every door there. A uh, place like San Rafael, a little more difficult. But we're, we're getting the cut now. So thank you for your time. It was our pleasure.